The what? The sal, it's like Sal would say. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, <laughs> all right. Welcome to Progressive <laughs> Soup. We're back to the miracle of uh, cameras and television and all kinds of cool stuff that's been around for a long time. We are back to talk about this time democracy elsewhere. We just got to finish having a great discussion about democracy in China and the potential there, maybe with a small, maybe with a lowercase p, but there's some potential there. But there's a lot of good stuff going on in the world that we've had John Kasumi on, uh, founder of China Support Network, to talk about before. He's back. We're going to get an update on what's going on country by country by country. And apparently there are a lot of countries that are making some great strides toward democracy. Well, yes. John, introduce yourself again, and let's get started. Um, yes, I, I have actually uh, keyed in on, on the price of food mm -hmm. as an essential driver of you know, the, the fact that people are you know, having the unrest, and they're coming out on the streets, and mm -hmm. they're protesting, and the, each and every, uh, you know, the, the Arab governments are under pressure. But even now, you look at Europe, and you've got people on the streets, uh, you know, Greece has been exploding. Um, Spain got a, a, a very surprising, very large protest movement. Um, I just heard today that the, the credit rating for Portugal has been cut to, like, junk status. Hmm. So that uh, Portugal basically is now priced out of the, the ability to borrow uh, money in the credit markets. Interesting. Um, you know, there's been unrest there. But, uh, you know, Ireland has been under pressure. There's been unrest there. Iceland, if you go back a ways, uh, Iceland, Iceland was one had of the first lots ones. of protests in 2008. Yeah. Um, they got hit very hard when the, uh, when the crash came while, uh, while a fellow by the name of George W. Bush was still president, and our, and our economy came very close to collapsing in, I think it was August of 2008, a couple months before the election. Yeah, yeah. Which gave our. our well, the $700 president. billion dollar bailout was the Dur October surprise of the presidential campaign. In yeah, other words, that was. It was, was like October 1st when they passed it. And, and, and yeah. You know, but the, the thing is that did you notice there was a bit of a seesaw battle? Because mm -hmm. earlier in the week they had defeated it, and then later in the week they passed yeah. that bailout. Yeah. Um, so uh, clearly, you know, people were, you know, still working all the angles and twisting arms. And, yeah. Um, but Iceland actually did not bail out its banks. Iceland looked at it and said, well, you guys are private enterprises. Interesting. And, uh, you know, you can go belly up, and that's what happens in capitalism if and you don't... Uh, they survived somehow, didn't they? Well, that's the thing. Iceland, you know, they took the hit basically up front, and, and you know, perhaps their currency was a little bit devalued, but... You know, the thing is that they're on the mend mm -hmm. now, okay? And Iceland is making a comeback. <clears throat> you know, they're ahead of the game because they didn't take it as a state obligation to be saddled with essentially the gambling debts mm -hmm. of, of, you know, private uh, banksters, if I can call them that. And, I and, and think that's a fair term to use. I think that this is the problem that we have worldwide. And, and, and I started by mentioning the price of food. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, you know, because that becomes manipulated. That becomes sort of, um, you know, when there's all of the, the financial speculation, you know, and uh, it's a casino mentality and, mm -hmm. and, and the gambling is basically pushing up the price of food. Speculating on commodities, if you will, right. sort of. Right. And, but it's cutting the, the legs out from under various governments. Yeah. Uh, you know, in other words, you know, when you have a rising price of food, you have the, the right pre- cursors or preconditions yeah. uh, for social unrest, um, you know, and of course we can add into that gasoline if you have, uh, you, you know, the price, it, of, yeah, uh, the price of oil is, is another yeah. matter of, of speculation. And you saw how hard it was on, on middle class Americans, well, then lower class, everybody but the, the uber rich pretty much felt the pinch of uh, $4 plus gasoline in the United States a few months ago, and of course there was all kinds of speculation. Uh, on the part of Fox and their party, hopeful speculation, the gas would spike up even higher mm -hmm. if that could give them an opportunity to cut the legs out from under the current administration. Because mm -hmm. they seem to, they seem to not, not worry about horrible things happening in America as long as it furthers their goal of getting that black guy out of there. The, the, the Republicans pretty much seem to you know, mm -hmm. want a, 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 a collapse or a calamity. Uh, sure. You know, if, it, uh, if it furthers their goals, I think they're willing to sacrifice 
But so you look everyone. at now, they're playing chicken over the, the raising of the debt ceiling. Yep. And, uh, you know, but that's, you know, a game of chicken is, is, is one in which it's also possible to go splat. Yeah. You, you can't promise that, uh, you know, that both parties will walk away unscathed from right. the confrontation. I think the only consistent one in this whole process has been the president of the United States, who's calling all of them out for being childish and comparing them to his own two daughters who apparently seem to be fairly good at getting their homework done in time to hand in mm. and, in fact, get their homework done in advance because they apply themselves and don't get distracted by extraneous things. Um, and the Congress, on the other hand, apparently both parties included are playing this game of chicken with, with our lives, mm -hmm. with our livelihood mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. for, to try to score political points. So back to, um, back to food. Food and problems, food and, and economic problems. Post-World War II, I believe, I um, wasn't alive then, but um, I believe I've, I've read about how you had some countries, France, for instance, where inflation was just running rampant and bread was just, it, mm -hmm. the, the price of bread would, would change Daily. And that would be would Germ take, Germany in between World War I and World War II. Thank you. Thank you for Wy that correction. Weimar, Weimar, Germany. Thank yes. you for that correction. And of course, you saw how that led to unrest in Germany and it allowed. That's when Weimar Ger yeah. Germany became Nazi Germany. Yeah, it, it allowed the, that guy, Hitler, in through the back door because he took advantage of the fact that middle class folks were so worried about their lives that they were willing to take a chance on anybody, including that guy, Hitler. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's, pretty, that's pretty sad and pretty dangerous. So today's countries, what do we have in the, um, in the Middle East? Uh, refresh us on what's going on, up to date us on, uh, on uh, we'll start, I guess we could start with Egypt. What's going on in Egypt? Well, I mean, at this point now, you know, Egypt uh, pushed out Hosni Mubarak. Mm -hmm. uh, what happened uh, then is the army uh, stepped up to control mm -hmm. uh, in some, you know, interim here. So now we are awaiting elections. Mm -hmm. um, the elections are supposed to come this fall. Um, okay. You know, although that's now led some people to complain, hey, wait a minute, that's too soon. We're not ready for elections yet. Now, There's going to be a lot of back You know, that's got to be the complaint of, like, you know, the political party that can't figure out how to yeah. make a bumper sticker. The one that feels they're behind is probably going to want to push the election off and hope that things change in their favor a little bit. But I don't think they take it to the extent that... Um, that um, the, uh, the the party of uh, Fox News is done in the United States, just hoping that the country collapses in order to further their goals. But at any rate, so Egypt has elections coming up in the fall, and we'll see hopefully some things happen there. We'll see something happen, and we'll just have to monitor it and see what type of government comes into place right. and hope as a nation, as a world, that we'll end up with something better, and the Egyptians will end up with something better right. than what they've tossed out. Well, but I think that something got started, you know. In other words, the Egypt uh, revolution was partly inspired because of an uprising in Tunisia, mm -hmm. Tunisia. that succeeded in pushing out their dictator. Yes. So How now, the thing is, now in, in Tunisia, it was uh, nicknamed... Now, some blogger came up with the, the, the term, the, the Jasmine Revolution. The Jasmine Revolution. What a nice sounding a term. And so the Arab Spring is basically the Jasmine Revolution. Mm -hmm. um, you know, however, there are people who take that and, and apply it farther afield. In other words, it inspired some young Chinese to call for a Jasmine Revolution in China. And actually, that's, I think, a step in the right direction. I, I, I really... You know, there may be such a thing as um, hardliner dissidents mm -hmm. and moderate dissidents, mm -hmm. you know, in which the hardliners want, you know, a regime change. It's like, okay, you know, you're the party in power or if yeah. you're Hu Jintao, you've got to go. You know, I mean, that actually worked out well in Egypt where the population just came out and said, you know, Mubarak, you know. Be gone. They just stood in the streets and said, we're not leaving the streets until the guy's gone. And so they had a singular focus on yeah. one thing, pushing out Hosni Mubarak. 
and that served them very well. Mm -hmm. um, now the thing is that dissidents may also exist in the moderate flavor, yeah. in which there, it's you know here's a reform agenda, and we're going to be reformists, but right. we're going to think about sitting down with the Communist Party mm -hmm. to try to work out the future of China. Incrementalists, um, in other words. Yeah, little and, by little, and they exist. But you know the thing is that that. You know, to the communists, that's the more reasonable path to, yeah. to sit down and discuss the future of China. But the communists don't even um, entertain that. Mm -hmm. You know, in other words, by rejecting the moderates, you know, they tend to create a more hardline democracy movement. Yeah, uh, yeah by, not, uh, by not at least agreeing for some, some movement right. towards what these, everybody these... seems to be looking for. You, you, you create more hardliners. These revolutions in the Arab Spring, though, are kind of showing us that hardline is the way to go. Mm -hmm. In other words, mm -hmm. go ahead, become hardline, you know, push out the dictator. That's certainly, the end, certainly gets you know, on the news better. It's certainly more newsworthy that's to, to the be hardliners. A, a revolution has got to change two things. It's mm -hmm. got to change the party in power, yeah. and then it's got to change the system of the society. Mm -hmm. And I recently gave a, a speech to a conference... Uh, because the Chinese dissidents were, you know, they convened this large conference at a, you know, hotel. It was near LaGuardia Airport mm -hmm. in New York. Uh, and this conference was hearing from various people, you know, including older uh, Chinese dissidents, you know, the, and then Tiananmen generation Chinese dissidents, mm -hmm. plus the Falun Gong practitioners. Yes. Uh, and then these younger, you know, we'll call them Generation Y uh, Chinese dissidents, you know, who have called for a jasmine revolution. Now, the, the thing is that everyone's getting on board. In other words, um, you know, I guess Generation Y has found its voice and, and influenced uh, the pro-democracy movement because this was a conference to be supportive of a jasmine revolution uh, for China. But I gave my speech there, and I started comparing Egypt with China. Mm -hmm. And... You know, uh, again, it comes back to the price of food. Yes. All right. Now, I had said that I have advice. You know, in Egypt, if you now have a clean slate or a new opportunity to remake, you know, government, you know, I have these two pieces of advice. One is um, do not accept any loans from the IMF. International Monetary Fund, yes. Right. And two is make sure that your government owns and operates its own central bank. All right, now that, that's the advice that really needs to be taken up because, you know, the Western world, or we can say the free world, has basically fallen into the hands of um, private bankers. Centralized people making decisions about other people's lives who are very far afield from where they are. Right, and honestly, we're supposed to have a private sector and a public sector. Yeah. You know? But the ownership of the Federal Reserve is, is private. The, right. It's a cartel. Uh, and if you haven't heard that before, you'll hear it again on this show for about the 10th time. Very factual. Federal Reserve is neither federal nor is it a reserve. It's a privately owned corporation which takes our money and then lends it back to us and gets paid to do that. Yeah. Now, now yeah. There, you can get that from anywhere on the political spectrum. People all across the political, political spectrum are, are of one mind on that important factor that the Federal Reserve and, again, as an extension of that, the International Monetary Fund. Well, we, we talked about it Well, the since show. your show is called Progressive Soup, yeah. you know, that means that you don't have to be a, a, a libertarian or, a, yeah. you know, a right-wing or a red pill type of person. Here you are, a progressive. Yeah. Uh, but we agree. And, yeah. and, and I'm, by the way, for my part, a practical idealist. Mm -hmm. And we agree. Uh, the Federal Reserve... You know, is about as federal as Federal Express. <laughs> nice comparison. Yeah. Nice comparison. Now, of course, we talk a lot on, on the show about people taking their money out of large multinational banks, uh, Chase, Bank of America, Wells Fargo, and putting them in local, putting their money in local banks and credit unions because what their local banks and credit unions do effectively mm -hmm. is reinvest in the community. Right, right. The larger banks... Sorry to say, if they did that, I'd be certainly willing to give them credit. Mm. But they don't do that. Right. So either they're going to affect change within themselves, Chase, Bank of America, Wells Fargo, and if I missed anybody, Citibank. Mm. Um, they could change, and I think we'd all be fine with that. If they could just act like members of the local community and reinvest within the local community, that'd be, that'd be fine. Yeah. 
But until they do that, we're going to be telling people, take your money out of there and put it in local banks and credit unions who reinvest locally. Yeah. Those are your neighbors. Those are people that, that, that care about whether, whether a city, the city of Danbury collapses or not. Yeah. Yeah. Chase couldn't give a hoot whether that happens, quite frankly. And, and, mm -hmm. I, and, yeah. and I say that with, you know, with all due respect to Chase or any of the other aforementioned large banks. So Chase, all the rest of you, change your behaviors. If you effectively change your behaviors, fine. Otherwise, get out of the way of progress. Yeah. So yes, and, and you know, I mean, basically, I, I was you know at this conference and making this point, um, you know, that 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 we need to reform uh, banking mm -hmm. and currency and speculation. Yep. All right, and they're almost inseparable because. Mm -hmm. You know, we can complain about the banks, but the simple fact is, what about the currency? Mm -hmm. All right, because at this point in time, it's not the gold standard; it's the trust me standard. All right. Well in other words, there is no backing to the currency. Mm -hmm. You know, it's that we are, you know, placing faith or placing stock in the the words of uh, yeah. what the Federal Reserve, because they can stamp out something that says Federal Reserve note. Yeah. You know, but it's words. It's entirely words, and it's words from the likes of Ben Bernanke. Uh, you know, and, 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 and we're basing and trusting our economy on, on, on that. And my friend, without trust, capitalism doesn't succeed. Yeah. Well, capitalism, to be successful, and mm. we are very strong capitalists here on this show. We believe in the free enterprise system, but we all know that when people lose faith in their government, in their banks, in the institutions that we're depending upon to represent us and be good and, and do right by us, we lose faith, then the whole thing collapses. And we've seen that in America in the Depression, banking, mm -hmm. speculative banking, and, uh, and everything that evolved out of that took, our, took, our, took us into a Depression. Right. And a lot of people think that a currency should at least be pegged to a commodity standard. Mm -hmm. You know, it doesn't necessarily have to be the gold standard. It could be the silver standard, mm -hmm. you know. Or, you know, we could find, um, you know, just ways of, of creating a peg between, you know, some kind of a real-world commodity. Or and, grains, and, and wheat, corn, yeah, 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 sorghum, yeah. Um, beef. Yeah. The things, that, the things that are a little bit more intrinsic and a little bit more Let's have something that's in us. the real world that we yeah. can count. Real world. Like, and what could be more real wor world than fruit, than uh, food and, uh, and water, yeah. for instance? Yes. And so the thing is that banking and currency needs to be reformed, but so too is this speculation, and, and this means Wall Street reform, mm -hmm. all right? Because, you know, I, I think there should be a law that if you order, um, you know, 6,000 barrels of oil, yeah. that you have to take delivery of 6,000 barrels of oil. Rather than just hold on to it on paper, right. mark the price a little Let's bit more. Let's have transactions and that it. are actually for market use. Actually real transactions rather than transactions. Yeah. And, and if the audience remembers Enron during the uh, 1990s, I believe, uh, Enron basically was trading with itself on paper. Mm -hmm. They'd sell it to, they'd sell it to, they, they'd pass it through 20 different country, companies, let's say, within Enron Every step of the way, they'd jack up the price. Somebody would draw some profit out of that. Eventually, when it got to number 20, they'd sell it to California mm -hmm. at an incredibly inflated price. And the people of California got stuck holding the bag. Mm -hmm. They were the ones that were paying all these steps of profit along the way. And profit, not for work, not for an honest day's work on somebody's part, but profit for paper shuffling. Right. right. It doesn't make sense, I don't think, to anyone, no matter where you are in the political spectrum. So, you know, I mean, there's uh, also, you know, certain, like, margin requirements okay. or uh, transaction taxes that could slow down, mm -hmm. you know, the, the, the speculative flow of hot money. And, uh, and the thing is that when we come to realize that it's driving up the price of food, that in poorer countries, you know, that the price of food is a matter of life and death. Yes. All right? We are, like, killing people, or we are, you know, people are dying of starvation right now. Because somebody, because somebody in a commodities market somewhere is making an, extra, an right. extra little bit of profit. And that isn't, that, isn't that a shame? Well, no, we, we simply shouldn't have the speculation. Mm -hmm. You know, in other words, if you order 10 tons of grain, take delivery of 10 tons right. of grain. And then, and then market the grain. Yeah. Don't market paper. Yeah. So, you know, when a transaction really means that something's actually 
happening or you know yeah. uh, uh, exchanging hands, then uh, you know then you've got a, a real world uh, counterpart to this uh, on paper transaction. Okay, back to Egypt, Tunisia, where else? Well, the thing is that the uh, the Arab Spring also seems now to be the European Spring. Mm -hmm. You had mentioned that, yeah. We're, um, we're, for instance, countries that are in a in a tough situation like Greece currently. Mm -hmm. Is uh, the people are looking for something a little bit better, something a little bit more responsive from their their government? Apparently, Spain has ended up with two political parties that dominate the whole process and Sounds pay familiar. no attention to the people. And Sounds familiar. You know this uh, inbred, uh, corrupt uh, system. Sounds even more familiar. And yes, so it sounds like Spain has basically American-style democracy. All right. <laughs> and, uh, and they're trying to, well, at least the protesters of that movement would be trying to uh, overcome that. And maybe spread out to more political parties and hopefully find, like Israel does. Israel's got maybe 20 different political parties. And they form coalitions on issues yeah. Yeah. rather than... Rather than have this two-party duopoly, right? That uh, that our friend many times I thought that the United States could be better off if we just had no political parties. Mm -hmm. well, you know, what's wrong with individual representatives without a political You know, party. using their own eyeballs and their own judgment. Mm -hmm. You know, as opposed to you know party discipline. Right. You know, in other words, uh, why not consider issues on the merits? Mm -hmm. And, you know, try to make the right, you know, de a decision that does right by the people. Sounds reasonable. Uh, you know, that's what we might have expected of I in a democratic government if we initially looked at the, you know, the, the early, um, you know, how, how it was presented, let's say, to us uh, way back in school or something. Yeah. You know, what was democracy supposed to be? Representative of the people. Yeah, either, either through direct popular vote, which would be democracy, or votes by our elected officials, which is a republic, which is, mm -hmm. which is actually... Mm -hmm. More what we are, but their democracy and the republic are well, just slightly different one from the other. There's not a, there's not a huge tangible. Charlie difference. was here on your show, and he mentioned that back in the uh, yes, what was it? The, the at the time that the Constitution was framed, Charlie Grabsky, and that's on YouTube. Yeah, our show with Charlie Grabsky, two three shows with but Charlie. The word uh, democracy and the word republic uh, used to be synonyms, pretty much. Yeah. Basically, they meant the same thing. Yeah, one was uh, Greek and one was uh, it, uh, Latin. Yes. Mm -hmm. So uh, you know, I, I, I guess I don't. Uh, you know, somehow in, in later years, people now quibble like there's a big difference between a republic and a democracy. But it's, honestly, no. It's my. It's a minor difference, certainly. So. Uh, but yeah, uh, you know the thing is that you know this this wave of revolutions, it's 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 great to see you know a change turnover of the leadership in Tunisia mm -hmm. and in Egypt, you know uh, they're working on it in Libya, they're working on it in Syria, yep. and uh, it's unfortunate to see what has occurred in Bahrain. Mm -hmm. But um, the thing is that that uh, we got that turnover. But we're not quite sure yet if we're stepping away from the IMF and the private central banks. Mm -hmm. Because honestly, I think that you know, it may in fact be necessary to have sort of a sympathy protest in America mm -hmm. or a sympathy revolution in America mm -hmm. in order to support the people of Egypt. Because the thing is that if the private central banks are unreformed, yeah. then the price of food doesn't go down in Egypt. In other words, if they came out to the streets in the first place, yeah. had their revolution in, because the price of food is too high, yeah. so the ultimate result they would like is for the price of food to go down, that's not going to happen unless and until we can reform central banking in the West, because the government you know, has the power to issue currency. Mm -hmm. That is a power of government. It logically belongs with the government. <coughs> So the government can and yeah. should do that itself without delegating uh, that task to the private sector. And, and the Federal Reserve basically is <coughs> the vehicle by which yeah. uh, the U.S. government delegates that task to the private sector. It's, um, it's, a, it's like a private sector takeover of the public sector. Uh, we need the public sector back and, 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 and going to bat yeah. on the side of the people. Yeah. Now, as a side note, the people in Egypt have been very supportive along the way, for instance, of the people, of the union workers in Wisconsin. Right, right. A lot of sympathy back and forth, a lot of uh, right. com camaraderie. 
And I also because they recognize that, as Americans should, that unions are the backbone of this country, and it wasn't unions that got us into this mess. It was large multinational corporations. Right. Right. <coughs> and unions you know. shouldn't be the ones to shoulder the uh, the, the responsibility for it nor shoulder yeah. the punishment. It's ridiculous. They're Wall all, Street has gambling debts and then they're, yeah. they're going to take it out by firing all the teachers in New Jersey? I don't think so. It doesn't make uh, any that, sense. That's, that's not uh, the way that it ought to uh, shake out. Um, <coughs> but, yeah, and I understand that Egypt itself has prior yeah. negative experience with the IMF. Yeah. In other words, the, the IMF by now is unmasked. Mm. You know, I mean, it, it's developed this reputation all the way around the world. Yeah. You know, uh, uh, you can say you can use the term food riot, or you can use the term IMF riot, because mm. th- these things happen um, all the time, and, and, and it's you know because the IMF has you know tried to privatize and impose austerity measures on the economies of these con- you know countries that became indebted to it. Uh, it's uh, someone has called the IMF the um, you know international mafia federation. We use the term banksters before. They're loan sharks. Yeah, you know, but at the national scale and yeah. And uh, that's not where Egypt should turn for assistance. That's not where Tunisia should turn for assistance. And at that conference, I told the Chinese dissidents, yeah. you know, that's not where China should turn for uh, assistance. So, um, you know, if we can get a uh, significant number of, of revolutions that are also, you know, stepping away from the banksters, mm-hmm. uh, you know, it, it would be nice to watch more and more of the world um, you know, begin to operate with uh, its own central bank. Reasonable solutions. But not, by the way, let me say, that means uh, a public se- central bank in each country. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah. I do not mean centralized. Right. I do not favor any form of, like, one world government. Right, so, so decentralization away from that one world banking system right. into, um, and I'm really not sure if, if banks in various countries would be competing with one another if they knew that, that the bank in France, let's say, knew it had no chance of doing business in Spain. Mm-hmm. There would be no, no motivation on their part if they understood that to be the rules of the game. Right. There would be no, no outreach to try to get, get a foothold. Right, right. When you have laws, they can apply across the board so yeah. that it's not favoring one competitor over another. You know, if uh, if the tariffs were raised at the border on Chinese goods, mm-hmm. you know, it applies equally to all importing firms. Everyone would have to, you know, play by the rules of the road. Seems reasonable. Seems like a, a pretty reasonable and sensible solution to what may be viewed as, as sort of a complex problem. Right. Thank you, thank you, thank you again for joining me. We'll have you back many times in the future to, to update us. Congratulations on the cable vision. Thank you very much. It's, it's pretty exciting that we'll be on uh, starting this month in July, uh, July 6th, uh, tomorrow. Uh, and going forward, Wednesdays, 6.30 to 7 p.m., cable vision, uh, Bridgeport to down to Greenwich. And uh, it's exciting, and uh, we're, we're trying to get some good progressive shows on, uh, on all these stations to... Um, to look, to look at the world in a, in a more objective and a less angry eye. We want to find common ground for sensible solutions. Come join us. Thanks. Well, thank you for having me.